Hi everyone, this is Intro Stats with Matt Touchot, and we are going to continue our discussion today about two population confidence intervals. So last time we looked at uh, dealing with uh, some of the, th the ideas of two population confidence intervals and how to explain them, and today we're talking more about some of the assumptions and some of the formulas that computers use to calculate these. Um, so let's get started. All right, so, um, so we're dealing with two population confidence intervals, and so we're going to be dealing with two population mean and two population proportion, okay? Uh, we'll also be um, get, talking a little bit about matched pair, which is sort of a different version of the two population mean confidence interval. Um, now, we've already gone over these assumptions before when we did one population confidence intervals, and really, two population confidence intervals, in a lot of ways, you're kind of expanding that. You're just kind of checking everything twice for your two samples. Uh, so for a two population confidence interval, uh, if you have separate groups, like if you're comparing every, every, everyone that lives in California to everyone that lives in Arizona, um, you'd want two random samples. So uh, we would want the individuals in each sample to be independent. So now this is an interesting one because, again, this is talking about really we want the individuals within the samples and between the samples to be independent of each other. So um, that's a little tricky one to, to actually uh, to make sure that you actually get independence. I told you before uh, an easy way to deal with um, independence is is it a small random sample from a large population. So if it's a small random sample from a large population, usually the we like the population size to be around 10 times, at least 10 times bigger than the sample size. Usually you're not going to accidentally get people that are related to each other if it, was a, if it was a random sample from a large population. And then we'd, both, we'd like both of the samples to be a uh, sample size of 30 or have a normal or bell shape, uh, the sample to have a normal bell shape. Um, sometimes they call that normally distributed. So the idea here is, with these assumptions, is, um, again, these were, we talked about these before with the central limit theorem, and this is sort of making sure that the sampling distribution comes out normal, which is what a lot of these formulas are designed around normal sampling distributions. And if your, normal sam if your sampling distribution does not come out normal, a lot of these formulas sort of break down. They're not as accurate. Um, now, matched pair is an interesting one. This is the one where we're basically looking at, usually it's the same people measured twice. So the, the, um, the two samples themselves are not independent of each other. They're usually like the same person. You could also get something like husband-wife or you're comparing two football teams, compare the quarterback to the quarterback and the running back to the running back. But basically think about like the first number in the first data set is a one-to-one -one pairing with the first number in the second data set. And the second number in the first data set pairs with the second number in the second data set. So we call that a matched pair. Usually it's the same people measured twice. So you have to kind of be, uh, that does change the formula slightly if you, it's a matched pair situation. It's really the formulas, uh, the assumptions are about the same. Uh, now we need just one random sample of people, but we're going to measure them twice. Uh, again, the individuals inside the sample will be independent, need to be independent of each other. But again, this, between the samples won't be independent because it'll be the same people measured twice. And then the sample size of the differences, usually we look at the differences between the ordered pairs, and that has to be at least 30 or normal. So really it's the same assumptions that we've already learned, it's just kind of checking everything twice and sort of applying it to the situation. Uh, two population proportion assumptions, again we want both samples to be random. We do want individuals within the sample and between the sample to be independent of each other. So these, you can't do a match pair with, um, well you can, but uh, it's a little more tricky. For, our, for this formula we're doing today, we need our, our samples to be independent of each other. So um, individuals within the sample and between the sample should be independent. Um, both samples should have at least 10 successes and at least 10 failures. Remember, that's the same assumptions that we learned before. Uh, this kind of ensures that the sampling distribution looks normal and, it, and everything lines up with margin of error and these margin of error formulas and the T-scores and the Z-scores critical values. 
So very similar to what we've done before in terms of calculation, now we're just applying it to two population. All right, so let's get just started here with these. These are pretty, uh, so I gave you some examples here. Long calculations. Remember, you, most people in the real world, data scientists, are not calculating this stuff by hand. We always put this data into a computer and we have a, a, a statistics software that really calculates all this. So don't like panic when you see calculations like this, like, oh my goodness, I have to calculate all of this by hand. Uh, I calculate it by hand because I'm just like that, you know, I'm a math guy, so I, I, li I like calculations. But in the real world, you don't really calculate this by hand. Everybody does this with, with statistic software. It's more important that you understand the idea of the formula and when it's accurate, when it's not, and what does the answer tell us, right? That's, that's kind of the big uh, question. So this first example is two population mean confidence intervals with separate groups. So the, I got this from the COC stat student data uh, on my website. Uh, so the first population one is uh, COC stat students that do not have a tattoo, and we ask them how much money did they spend when they eat out uh, on average. And population two would be COC stat students also, but now these are ones that had a tattoo, and we're trying to compare those and how much money did they spend when they eat out. So we're trying to see if there's a significant difference between these two, which one's higher, that kind of thing. So this was the sample data. Uh, the sample mean, now if you'll notice, now you have these little subscripts. So we've learned X bar and S and N, right? X bar is the mean, S is standard deviation, N is sample size. But now you see this little one next to it, right? The one is the uh, telling you it's from group one or population one. And this one, it, or, uh, this one is from um, the yes tattoo group. This is group two. You see these little subscript two there. So this is the sample data from the yes tattoo group. This is the sample data from the no tattoo group. So you have these little subscripts now. Okay, so how do we calculate this? Well, we already learned the basic idea of a confidence interval uh, for means and proportions was to get the sample and to add and subtract some kind of margin of error, right? And we actually already learned that the, for means, usually we use a t-score, uh, a critical value t-score times the standard error. So standard error, remember, was the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, okay? But now, remember what we learned last time. Two population doesn't measure population one. It doesn't measure population two. It tries to measure what? The difference, right? The difference between them. All right, so I got the difference. So notice it doesn't say sample mean, it says the difference between the sample means. Now, one of the key things that's very tricky about a, a, a formal two population uh, confidence interval like this is the T score would have to be looked up with degrees of freedom. Now, degrees of freedom calculation is a terrible formula. In fact, I'm not even going over it right now. But if you go online and just look up uh, two population mean degrees of freedom calculator. There's like 10 of them on the, uh, out there and you can actually just put your data in and it'll give you the degrees of freedom. Uh, but it is a pretty tricky calculation. Um, I went ahead and looked up the t-score for this degrees of freedom was 128 um, and it was 1.979. Again, I'm not a big table guy. I don't look like, I don't like my students using tables very much. I always want them using technology. So I, I actually looked this up on StatKey, which is one of my favorite programs on the market. It's, it's free and it's fabulous. Um, okay, so, uh, so here's the formula. The formal formula looks terrible. Uh, sample one, uh, sample mean from group one, minus the sample mean of group two, plus or minus the t-score times the standard error. So this is sort of the standard error estimation formula. So we've been talking about before computers were invented, uh, statisticians and mathematicians came up with formulas that would estimate the standard error. A lot of times nowadays when we, cal we, can cal we calculate and look at stand uh, sampling distributions, we can actually get the standard error right off of that. But now this was a way of them estimating the standard error. So this is the formula. It's really the sample variance from group 1 divided by the sample size of group 1 plus the sample variance of group 2 divided by the sample size of group 2. And now it's just a matter of plugging all this in. I had a lot of fun doing this. Yeah, just plug it all in. This is something I don't really do a lot. I actually use the computers. You know, the computers do all this. Um, 
And uh, later in my next video, I'll actually show you how you can actually do all this with a computer software and uh, not have to calculate this. So the main thing is, okay, so we got dollars spent with no tattoo was group one, yes tattoo, dollars spent was group two, and my confidence interval at the end of the day comes out to be negative 2.845 to positive 0.433. So roughly negative uh, $2.85 and positive 43 cents. Now this number right here, 1.639, that was the margin of error. So this right here is the margin of error. And that's an important number in confidence intervals, right? This is the margin of error. So this tells me that my sample difference could be off from the population difference by about $1.64, somewhere in that area. Okay, so it's a good idea. Remember, the main thing is not so much that you calculate this, but that you know what these numbers mean or what they're telling us. Now, if we learned last time, what does a negative positive confidence interval tell us? Anybody remember? Okay, negative positive means no significant difference. So the amount of money that people, uh, that the amount of money that COC stat students that do not have a tattoo uh, when they eat out is not significantly different with the uh, amount of money that people with a tattoo when they eat out. So that's what negative positive tells us, not significantly different. The two populations are very close, and even though I can see slight differences in the, in the sample means, they're not significant. They're not really a significant difference there. All right, let's move on. Whew, all right. So two population proportion confidence interval, same idea. I actually used almost the same data, except this time I looked at just the proportion or percentage of people, the COC stat students that had a tattoo versus not have a tattoo. Again, one of the things I would need to mention to you that's very critical, you got to know, when you look at a computer program, you got to know what was group one and what was group two. Probably the most important thing is the signs of the confidence interval and what was group one and what was group two? Because remember, the computer's always going to do group one minus group two, and that'll be go a long way in terms of our interpretation. So I, my, the people without a tattoo is going to be group one, with a tattoo was group two. Actually, kind of following what I was doing in the previous example. Okay, so we said again, the main formula for proportions or percentages, sample.